Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to Enterprise Linux Security, where I'm going to try not to have a camera issue that makes today's podcast audio only. How you doing, Zhao? All good, Jay. As always, a pleasure. 53 episodes in. I mean, that's a lot. Well, I'm a little nervous because, you know, 53 DNS, DNS is always a problem. <laughs> <laughs> I actually hadn't made that connection, but good point there. Um, so yeah, any issues, it's DNS fault. Um, today we have a news story about security, obviously, and we have a main topic after that. I won't spoil the topic yet, but you might have seen there at the top. So yeah, keep in mind, we'll be talking about twins. Let's just see what type of twins. And Hopefully not evil stories. twins. That's what I'm yeah. hoping. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the first thing I wanted to bring up real quick is just an example of something we've already talked about, supply chain attacks. Although I'll admit this isn't as bad as it could be because, well, I'll tell you why. So um, in the Python package index, or PyPy for short, um, according to Ars Technica, they reported that three libraries were uploaded there that are uh, malicious. And those are colors lib, HTTP, HTTPS lib, and lib HTTPS. So, you know, the latter two being a play on the, their own names. And our understanding is that these are, you know, from a new developer. So it's not as bad as something that's been out for a very long time, right? And just all of a sudden turns evil. Um, this is just yet another example. Now, obviously, it's important to um, you know look at the things that you're going to consider including in your project. But these libraries actually download uh, malicious executables onto the system. Uh, some of which, you know, we're going to sound like a broken record here because we've already kind of mentioned some of these. But they're, the names are very um, innocent sounding, like update.exe, uh, for example. Oh, that's the updater. I'll just let that run. It's fine. It, it's totally fine. Um, and, and yes, um, I did say .exe. So, um, you know, this article um, alleging is probably looking at a Windows system and considering the antivirus uh, screenshots, I would have to say I'm probably right. But then again, Python is not specific to Windows. And I wanted to mention this because um, even though, again, it's not the worst thing that could happen, it's just yet another example of the trend of supply chain attacks. Yeah, this is actually a variation of something we discussed before where either the developer it's himself or herself went rogue and applied malicious code to their actual packages or somebody took over the repositories. We've covered both of those situations before. The, the idea here is that it's a new developer, somebody that submitted new packages, apparently with innocent sounding names, even if a bit dumb, HTTPS lib and lib HTTPS, but... And by the way, the second one has nothing to do with HTTPS. It's a terminal uh, UI thingy. Go figure why it was named like that. Um, but yeah, if you were just looking at the time to find a package to help you do some of that those tasks, you might come up with these on the search results and might just decide to use them. It's always a good idea to be wary of new new packages. Wait a couple of days, a couple of weeks to see if somebody has any issues with them. Um, as was the case with this ones, And to the point of this dropping .exe files, um, it's not uncommon for the, the payload to actually vary over time, so it could very well connect to a command and control server somewhere and after some time start to deploy something for Linux rather than Windows. So it can happen that the same packages have different behaviors over time, and that's something that we've seen in the past. Yep, so um, we'll have a link in the, uh, wherever you're downloading this from, we'll have a link there to the article. Just make sure not, you, you know, you're not using these, and, and if you are, um, purge everything, burn it all down. <laughs> you know, hopefully no one's using it, um, considering that um, at least two of them came out as of January 7th, so, you know, just, just over a week ago from the time we were recording this, chances are no one does, but, you know, just double check. There is another interesting thing here. Um, one of the files that's dropped is called searchprotocolhost.exe. If you manage Windows systems, this is actually a pretty common um, executable name, a pretty common process name to see on the task list. Um, so you might not suspect it. And this goes into something I remember mentioning 
quite a few episodes back, by the way, so nobody else should be remembering it. But um, there was a time where people would actually know how large a specific system file would be from memory. For example, how Notepad would be, I don't know, 43 kilobytes long or something like that. So if something with a different size came up with the lock name, you would spot it. Today, it's impossible to do that. There are always different versions being run simultaneously and one has an update, the other doesn't. So the files will change um, their size. But at the time, it was possible to, to keep an eye on those things. Um, yeah, and this one would be something like that that would raise your flags, your sysadmin sense would be tingling if that was the, the case. Um, yeah, that was just something that sprung to mind when I read the story. Yeah, I completely agree. Yep, absolutely. So yeah, again, check out the article for those of you that are interested in this. And I think it's probably time to move on to the main topic and we're going to talk about <laughs> yeah, twins. Digital twins, to be more precise. Um, let's rewind the story a bit. So in 2010, so about 13 years ago, um, NASA, the space agency, came out with this digital twins term to describe a process that they were using to not to simulate, but to actually test their their rockets. And the idea here is that this is a more advanced form of a simulation. You're not just taking a, a product or a service or a process at a specific point in time and seeing how it behaves, um, as you would do, say, in a lab environment with a server. You could copy the server running a series of, tasks, of tests against it on a lab environment and see how it performed, and then move it back to production, for example. That would be a simulation, for example. Of course, this is just a simple example there. Uh, but um, but still, the, the idea of a digital twin when applied to IT, and we're going to cover several different aspects of this, but applying digital twins in IT is that you have a copy of a running system, but set up in such a way that all the, the inputs that reach the, the production system will also reach the digital twin. The idea being that you have an easy and disposable virtual machine or container or whatever, the twin, where you can run tests, you can run your security scripts, you can test your updates and all of that, and it will always be in sync with the, the main one, with the production one. This makes setting up things like lab environments much easier and much more accurate. Yeah, um, so this is actually strangely a concept that I haven't um, heard of before. But I also kind of have because, you know, we have the concept of a warm site, you know, when it comes to physical infrastructure, maybe not necessarily the same use case, although there's overlap where, you know, some of the use cases might be the same. But, you know, with that, the idea is you have another data center um, that's really expensive, though, because you have to buy a, like a whole new server rack that has all the same things in it um, as the other and be ready to go. But technically, you can have a warm site with uh, cloud as well. It's just, you know, the virtual version of that. But, but now we have, um, you know, the twin concept where it's, um, I think, a much bigger thing because of the use cases here. And we always like to understand, you know, what makes something break? How does someone get into things? It's always good to have something to look at and understand how it works. But, it, you know, to your point, that's, uh, that could be a very useful thing for sure. Yeah. Um, so this has been used more extensively in the engineering field, the actual people that build, say, robots or assembly line equipment or all of that. And they will get all the sensors into those systems and they will create a, a simulation, in this case, a digital twin in a virtual machine or in some kind of modeling application. And they will feed it the actual feed, the actual inputs that the physical object receives, they will pass it to the, the digital twin to see how it behaves, for example. Um, that makes stuff like prototyping, like developing new features, much more accurate and much more uh, related to reality than just the simulation where you... Say, for example, you have an architectural plant. You have a CAD drawing, you have the 3D model in your device, but you don't see how it behaves with uh, wind, with uh, changing weather, with the actual terrain changes and all of that. And if you could feed it the actual data from the field as it is right now, you would get a much more accurate re reflection in that digital format. Um, this is used, say, 
again, uh, assembly line equipment, uh, robotic arms, for example, where you get the the inputs from all of the positioning, all of the movements that the robot does, so that you can have a testing, say, I would like to say scenario, setting, whatever you want to call it, um, where you can test, say, how to optimize it, how to optimize its movements and all of that, without wasting the money on another physical robot, which tend to be quite expensive. Um, and you can iterate time and time again because you can always recreate the digital twin. It's this, the the novel thing here, it's this link and the, the fact that it's constantly receiving data from the actual physical counterpart, the actual physical twin, if you want to call it that. So I have to just ask, you know, we're talking about robots. So how much does a uh, Cylon cost nowadays? Okay, don't answer <laughs> that. Don't answer that. Um, yeah, so I mean, basically, there, there's so many use cases. And when you apply these concepts to systems, just like you're saying, they're constantly being updated. I mean, how many times do system administrators run into situations where, you know, the system goes down or a server goes down? It's like, okay, what happened? It was, you know, what, what's going on here? Just to find out, um, at least in my case, this happened often with like something like Jira or Confluence or one of those apps. And someone's running a really intensive report that, um, you know, they're just trying to g grab all the data, but you never know who ran it because the logging is really terrible. So you, you don't want to go around asking everyone to do that. But then again, you could, you could when you find out what report caused it or what job caused it or, or what have you, trying to reproduce it on that other system that's on a separate network. It's not something that people could generally get to. So you could kind of try to reproduce that, get it down to a science when it comes to the root cause. And then, you know, that, that better equips you to really understand, you know, what, what went into making the server fail and if you could reproduce that you know all the time then chances are you've probably figured it out catastrophic failures are the best use case for this so you have again a robotic arm i'll go to the the system the it system in a minute so you have a robotic arm all of a sudden it blows up or bursts into flames or something like that and it's unrecoverable you want to be able to find out what happened to it so you can check the digital twin which obviously didn't not burn up but had received all of the information that the, the other one did. So you can actually go back and see, okay, these were the inputs that caused the situation. And now you can fix it. Now you can address the issue. If you did not have that, then there would be no easy way to actually pinpoint the, the root cause that made that robotic arm burst into flames. On an IT system, imagine you have a malware infection in your system, in your server, and you cannot get to the log files, you cannot get to your data monitoring, to anything there in that, serv in that server because it, everything is encrypted. If it's properly set up and you pass along all the data that it received, you can have a look at the logs, you can have a look at that state before the infection, because the attacker will hack into one, but not hack into the other necessarily. When we say that you want to, to pass it all the inputs, it's all the inputs that are interesting to you. Um, you don't have to replicate the user interface access on one you, and replicate it in the digital twin. But if, say, for example, you're dealing with data that comes from a database, you can feed the same data that goes to one system to its twin. Okay, so at some point, you can always go back and check, okay, this is what led the system to this state. I can walk it backwards. I can see what came in. This caused this. And this is what led to the attack, for example. Or this is what led to an exploit being available or something like that. Um, it's it's a great forensics tool. It's a great methodology change to, to look at it this way. Because traditionally, what you would do is you have a lab environment, you set up your replica or whatever amounts to a replica of your production systems, which would never have the actual proper load that you get on production, would never have the eyeballs on it that you have on production. Um, so it's just something that you use sporadically to test an update or to test a, a specific scenario at at certain points in time. With the digital twin, those are always up to date. Um, if you've ever managed a lab environment, one of the struggles is actually keeping the lab environment in sync so that when you're testing updates, you're actually testing it meaningfully so that the results actually have an impact on what's in production. Uh, but then you'll have to re-image and you'll have to move all the data over and you have to make sure that stuff didn't break in the meantime. Um, 
This is a different approach to that. Keeping the data in sync between the two systems will avoid all of those, all of those processes. And that's key. You know, you want them to be the same. It's not a good test if one is different, right? You, you want them to be as, as similar as possible. So if they're both receiving the same data, then they should be the same. And with that said, I mean, that's just like a constantly updated lab environment. If you want to reproduce anything, and just like you're saying earlier, it could be you have a, a task you want to finish faster. What would happen if you, I don't know, if you're using Ansible, Chef, Puppet, whatever it is, and you, you, you think you found a way to, to make the amount of time it takes for those jobs, those config jobs to run lower, then you could set up a proof of concept over there with the same everything and just see if you get the time savings that you think you're going to get. Or in the case of security, you know, how did how did this happen? Uh, what was the most recent uh, series of logs that led up to that? And you'd have a um, an environment where you could find out. Absolutely. The, that's one of the perfect use cases for this. Um, we will cover at a high level how to set something like this up further down the, the episode. Um, there are just some important facts that you need to consider if you're going to go down this route and um, the security implications of this, because there will be um, a link between the, the actual source device or system that you want to, to have a twin of, um, and you need to keep that communication channel secure. So that's where stuff like IPsec tunnels, like specific networking rules will apply that only communication between this system and its twin is allowed. Um, there is another implication there that if you want to have actual digital twins at the system level, you don't even want to change the, the IP addressing. So you'll have the same IP address in two different places. So you'll have to separate that at the routing level, at the switch level as well. So different VLANs, separate subnets, all of that, so that you don't mess that up and you don't let them communicate over each other when a third party service wants to reach them. Um, in fact, the digital twin should only receive data from its source, from its other twin. Uh, it shouldn't actually be reaching the other systems. If you're screaming out the top of your lungs right now, okay, so how will communications work if it's not talking to the third party systems? This goes back to what I said before. You will only want it to receive stuff that's meaningful. Say you have a Windows system that you want to have a twin of. So that system is doing something. It's not just a Windows system. It's running a service, it's running a file server, it's running an email server, it's doing something, a web server. So you will only move along the traffic that's meaningful to that. You won't change, you won't have it report to Active Directory the same system into different places because that will mess up Active Directory and that system. Um, but you will have to identify the, the stuff that you want to mirror and pass along. Um, again, there are some caveats to this approach, but if your environment is complex enough that the lab that the lab environment is not working for you, or if you're struggling to create a, a meaningful lab environment that recreates the, the production workload, this digital twin approach is probably more up your alley. There is software that helps you with this. There are specific solutions that you can point the server to, for example, and they will create a twin out of it. Um, some of it will be based on virtual machines, other in containers, other in stuff like that. It will work on top of all of those stacks. Um, again, we don't promote specific products for this, but the concept is out there. Uh, if you look for, if you do a search for digital twins, you can find those. Um, Moving back to the to the physical aspect of this, there is another aspect where it touches in IT again. Um, when you're trying to replicate a, a physical device as a digital twin, you need all the information you can get out of it. Back to the robotic arm, you need sensors in place to provide you all the information so that you can replicate its behavior. So you'll need to add sensors in places where they don't exist. And what's a great solution to add sensors today? It's the IoT stuff like the Raspberry Pis out there, where there are low cost computing devices that you can quickly add a, a sensor to and you can network those stuff pretty easily. So you will have another host of systems that you need to, man to monitor and manage, which are basically the sensors and that you will have to allow communication to the twin, to, to recreate the twin. Um, 
but that brings another security concern there. So be ready to set up separate VLANs just for that. Be ready for separate networking. Be ready for another batch of, love, of systems that you need to keep up to date and all of that. But at the end of the day, again, the, the information that you can get out of a digital twin is really, really interesting. And stuff like... Uh, sorry, buzzword alert, industry 4.0, um, all the new technologies that come with that. The, again, I don't want to, to get into all the buzzwords around that, but all the new automation stuff, all the new ways to, to accelerate factory processes and all of that, um, they are found foundationally integrated with stuff like this. You will have sensors everywhere. You need to accommodate for that. You will need to have a separate infrastructure for your factory equipment and all of that. So, yeah, it's not something that you're going to deploy overnight, but it's a very, very interesting concept. And I think paying a special, special attention to the networking, which you've already mentioned, but I just want to underscore this because... You know, few things are as annoying in system administration than split brain or a client running on the wrong instance. And then you have to try to sort that out and explain to the client why this happened. Um, I mean, when we talk about, you know, segmenting the network, we really, really mean that. The only way in should be the channel through which the copied information is going through but customers should not be able to reach it. And you definitely don't want uh, threat actors to be able to reach it because I guarantee you, if they know there's a twin and they can get to that twin, they will also shut down the twin too. So, you know, that, that they'll look for that. So you wanna make sure that you don't make that too easy and that the only communication that goes to that network is communication that's been blessed and has been approved for that purpose and is required for that purpose. And as long as you pay a special attention to that, you should be fine. But I have seen maybe not this concept, but I, I you know, if you have like multiple database servers or multiple servers of any kind, you have probably run into a split brain situation before and it's just not fun. <laughs> oh, absolutely not. Um... <laughs> and what about duplicate IP addresses? Without proper management and you're hit with those, you can be stuck running around for hours trying to find it and you'll just you'll get just spurious get errors, 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 errors everywhere. everywhere. It's a mess. Yeah. Um, right. <laughs> it's like, why is my SSH connection dropping with the connection saying it's reset? Every time I go into the server, my connection drops a minute later. Why is that? Well, because two IPs are responding. <laughs> In my case, it was backup jobs that would fail occasionally after two or three minutes and they would just drop and then restart again and they would do that over and over again. And man, the, the, the system that was using the same IP address wasn't even a Linux box, was a Windows one. So the communications were just all weird. Sometimes you could SSH into the systems, other times you couldn't. Yeah, it was pretty stupid to track down. For some them, <laughs> for some them, my reason at the time the the routing was not complaining that the same IP was in different places. So packages from one part of the network would reach one, packages from another part of the network would reach another, and when the system would reply, sometimes it would reply correctly. Uh, <laughs> the keyword there be sometimes. Again, it's kind of like the NS. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyway, you can think of a digital twin as a hot spare if you, if you like. If it's properly configured, if you have the right information in place and something catastrophic hits the, the main one, you might be able to pull it off bringing out the digital twin and just letting stuff happen normally through the twin. A properly configured one for some services will replace the, the main one. Ideally, it would happen for all of them, but there are um, other implications that, again, like I mentioned before, on Windows systems, for example, Active Directory really does not like it changing the um, changing stuff like the identifiers and all of that. And if it's talking to a system and then another comes up, it will think that you're trying to impersonate it and will tombstone it in the Active Directory and it's a mess to bring it back. So yeah, Windows might not be the best example for this, but Linux boxes are a bit more condescending and will let you do these type of things without complaining too much. 
And it's not going to happen as often on Linux, but you also have licensing issues too. Um, it's a clone of a system, so technically it's not being used by end users, but it yeah. does exist. So technically there's probably a little payout required for licensed software. Oh, yeah. <laughs> It just brings to mind SQL Server and how messed up its licensing is. Um, yeah, let's move on. Um, if you're a product manager and you happen to be listening to this, you might remember um, that digital twins are a pretty interesting concept for lifecycle product management as well, because you can test the, the features of a product, you can test new approaches, different ways to implement a specific feature, and you can test all of that in the twins. Uh, at that point, it's a cost-saving measure because you don't need to prototype, you don't need to bring in new hardware to test it, you don't need to go back and forth with design. You just have the twin, you make the changes to the twin. If it doesn't work, you roll it back and try a different one. Um, so it's really interesting in that, res in that aspect. Um, again, the, the security implications here. Um, if you're properly segmenting your traffic, when one system gets hacked, for example, this is a hot spare that you can pull in. You can trace back and go over the logs and go over all the data to see what caused it, how it was breached, and all of that, without the associated risks, because nobody has actually entered that system and, say, deployed ransomware, as I mentioned before. That that's a very good um, that's a very good advantage. If you've ever been in the situation where you have a hacked system, that you need to find out how it was hacked and so that you can prevent it in the future, having something like this in place would be really really helpful. Obviously, it has to already be in place. It's not something that you can come up after the fact and try to solve it from there. But again, another tool to consider for your tool set. Absolutely, absolutely. And, um, you know, things like this, I think, just make things a lot easier because, you know, if you've ever been in a situation where you're trying to do a root cause analysis, if you don't have the logs, you're going to have a hard time. I mean, you're, you're just going to have a hard time. And at the end of the day, um, you might not even be able to have a root cause analysis. You have a, a, a hypothesis, and that's the best that you could come up with. But that might not be what upper management is satisfied with. So um, th that could really help and kind of make you feel like more of a superhero than you already are. If you can say, yep, first they did this, then they did that, and they did this, and we could fix it by doing that, and that'll make it not happen again. And that actually really impresses people. Okay, so how do you go about and set up something like this? Um, there are a few tools that can actually help you with the more tricky part, which is replicating the traffic. Um, there is an extension for IP tables called T, T E E, which does exactly that. It sends a specific packet to another, another, another IP address, another exactly an IP address there, another system, and keeps a copy on the local machine. So it basically creates a copy of a packet, sends it off. You can send that off to the, to the twin if the service that you're trying to replicate allows for that. Um, and that's a pretty basic level and pretty low level approach to that. Um, if you have something like, say, HA proxy, HA proxy will also let you do that. You can send the traffic to two different hosts, for example. So you can have an HA proxy in front of your service that is actually duplicating the code. At the networking level, there are tools like port mirroring, where the traffic that reaches one port is mirrored to a different port. You can also use that approach to send the traffic that way. Always keeping in mind that other than that specific point of duplication or access or replication, there should be no other traffic directly hitting the, the digital twin. That's very, very important to keep in mind. You only want the traffic that you're controlling that, and that you really want to be duplicated to actually be sent that way. Um, this will avoid you a whole bunch of uh, headaches down the line. Yeah, I was just about to mention port mirroring and you beat me to it because that is definitely a way to do this. And, and that, I think that's... The first time I've heard of any concept like this, like a long time ago, when a you know when I first starting, and a colleague of mine we were talking about port mirroring, and I didn't know about it. I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. But I think um, in my mind, it would be you'd have to go through a little bit more work, I would think, to not mirror the things you don't want to mirror, like like um, encrypted files, right? If if there's a ransomware, you don't want to mirror that <laughs> because then both are both of them are are taken over. But um, you know, that's I think that's like to your point. You just got to spend some time 
you know, architecting this and, you know, just start with a flow chart, basically on, on paper or something and just kind of map how you think it might look, get some other feedback on that. And then, um, you know, from there you can start building it out. And I would also think you'd probably need some buy-in from upper management too, because that's not a quick five minute thing. No, this this is a bit more complex to set up. The payback here is after it's properly set up, it lets you do a whole bunch of stuff that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise. And it's just like if it was being done in production. That's the whole value of it. Um, again, one of the difficulties that I've ever had, that I've always had in, in lab environments in the past, and I know many people struggle with this, is that they cannot recreate the exact load that they have in production. Even if they throw load load creating stuff at it, load creating applications at it, it's never exactly the same the same profile of access, the same rhythm of connections, all of that. There's always a difference there. And there are some issues that only crop up in very specific situations. And by Murphy's Law, you know that those will only come up in production. Those never come up in the lab environment. So you might be having an issue trying to diagnose something that only happens, say, at 4 a.m., 32 in the morning every single day and you haven't been able to pinpoint exactly why but somehow the httpd daemon always restarts at exactly that time you've looked at all the, the logs and all of that and if you have something like this in place you might be able to pick it up that it's because a backup connection is attempted to a port that's being handled by the httpd and the connection just makes it crash and all of that um, otherwise, it would be really, really tricky to recreate that. You don't want your sysadmins awake at that time looking at the logs, and even then they will be able to, to spot it like this. Having something that you can both recreate but also move back and forward in time, because the stuff that gets passed to the digital twin can also be logged, so that there's a replay functionality here. You can move back and forth with the current state of the, the digital twin. Um, the value there, if you've ever been hit by problems that are really tricky to diagnose, will become obvious at that point. Yeah, I, I think it's important when you're getting buy-in for this, to be honest. Don't sell this to your CTO as this will be a 100% duplication that'll always be exactly the same in every circumstance and then find out that there's an edge case like you mentioned and you know it could be users, it could be anything. Um, there's always going to be that thing, but I think more often than not, you could pretty much get this nailed down. Like like one example is I tell people, um, test your hardware with uh, Linux live media. It's the best thing ever because if you're having a problem with a piece of hardware, now we're talking about physical hardware, um, you know, do you have the same problem in live mode, you know, whether it's network card support or this or that, but you still have every now and then a situation, it's very rare when it works fine in live mode, but installed it doesn't. And that's an edge case where that doesn't work. And in this case, you're gonna have, um, you're not gonna be able to replicate the users. I, I, I know exactly what you're talking about when it comes to, I think it's like some kind of user simulation or user load simulator or something like that, where you just have like a, a massive number of fake users accessing things at the same time. Um, it's not quite the same thing because it's not doing what the user does. I mean, you could have a bunch of users hitting refresh too many times. I mean, you, how, how are you going to know, right? But yeah. taking all that out of it, um, more often than not, I mean, this is really going to be helpful. Um, just understand there, there could be an edge case. Be honest with upper management. Look, this is going to be a the best lab environment we could possibly have. And maybe if there's hopefully not a problem, but if there is, we could try to figure out how it happened. And I just remembered at the start, I didn't mention this, I should have. There is a, a different concept called the replica. If you're doing vSphere stuff, if you're doing stuff with Hyper-V, you can set up virtual machine replicas. It's not exactly the same thing. The replica gets the, the same state as what's in production exactly. Not at the service level, there's no fine grain control over that. So if one gets ransomware, the replica will get ransomware as well. The idea here with this is that as you are segmenting the, only the specific stuff that you want to, to have in the digital twin, say, for example, a web server, you will only pass along the web server information. You don't pass along the user sessions. You don't let the user connect to a random port, for example. You only pass the, the specific traffic aim that the ports that you're serving. So you don't expose the other ports on the digital twin. Um, it's not exactly a digital replica. It might be related on some scenarios. It might overlap with that functionality, but it's not the same thing. 
Yeah, that's a really good point too. Um, because you know, so in some cases we want it to be the same, but sometimes not. And ra ransomware is a good example of that. So um, you have to, you know, that that to your point. I mean, a replica is a replica, good or bad, in that case, and and that's probably useful in a lot of situations, but not quite what we're talking about. Yeah, this will become more obvious not just for IT systems, for servers, for example, but for IoT devices, for when you want to try new processes, say, for example, you want to model, it, to model a new way to, a new sales pipeline, for example, you can create um, a model of that and then you can feed it the real data that's hitting the, the real one, the one that you have in production and see how the new one behaves. This doesn't have to apply just to physical stuff. It can apply to processes as well. So what happens if we have two different databases serving the information rather than just one? And you can actually see how it behaves that way, but being fed with actual real life data. And that's the whole difference there. Um, the load creating, the load generating ap applications out there, there are many for web servers, for mail servers, for file servers. There are many tools that you can use to recreate load patterns. It just never manages to be exactly the same as production for whatever reason. Murphy's Law, like you said, you already mentioned that one. So it's just like whatever can go wrong probably will. Um, yeah. But but then again, you know, that that it, that's just being sarcastic. It's not really that bad. It's actually... Um, you know, as long as you keep in mind the user load thing and in some of those edge cases, I mean, what you're left with is a lot of scenarios where this would definitely help. Yeah. If you're actually interested in what we've been describing here, just do a, lo do a search for digital twins. You'll see some information that's very interesting out there. Um, read up on that. This is something new to consider for your for your tool set. It hasn't been around for long. The concept itself hasn't been around for long when applied to IT. It has been more related to engineering and to, again, Industry 4.0. Um, but who knows? You might be managing the, the factory equipment. You might be managing IT at the factory level. And this is something right up your alley. Yep. Absolutely. So another foundational topic, and uh, this is a fun one. Yeah. So thank you very much for joining. Thanks to everybody who, who is listening. It was a pleasure, and until the next one. See you next time. Bye.